Exodus 17, 8 through 13. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to jo Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand up on the hill, <clears throat> on top of the hill, with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites, as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held, up, <clears throat> excuse me, held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Please be seated. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy. Well, as the, we've talked about a bit with the kids, and Shirley mentioned earlier, we've had a great seven days of prayer. Um, we ended last night in this place with praise. It was a wonderful time of praising the Lord together and worshiping Him. Um, by now, you've probably seen the text of today's sermon, right? Um, and it may seem contradictory, but if you think about it, I would submit to you that it's really true for most of us. The title, if you haven't looked on your bulletin yet, is Too Busy Not to Pray. Many would say this way, I'm too busy to pray. I don't have enough time. I'm so busy just doing everything, all the things that I have to do, I just don't have time to pray. And I would submit to you that that may seem a paradox, but it works. There was a guy named Martin Luther who said this, and I've got my quote slightly different. He, you guys know who Martin Luther was, right? He was the guy who started the Great Reformation, right? He wrote books and volumes, and he, and he said this, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. That's a contradiction. It doesn't make sense. I have so much to do. I, I better spend the first part of it praying, and yet it's true. We know that prayer, prayer is important. Um, got a couple slides from last week as we've talked about prayer. If you only pray when you're in trouble, you're in trouble, right? If you only pray when you're in trouble, and the other one was this. If prayer were your job, would you still be employed? Those are good questions for us when we consider that prayer is probably the most important thing that we can do in our relationship with the Lord, and equal to it, I would say, is reading his word. And I would say both, often both of those go together. You can't separate those two things. Because, remember, prayer is communication with God, and we like to do our talking, but I would, say, I would submit to you most of the time God talks to us through his word. He really does. I can't tell you the number of times when you're looking for answers and God brings a passage to mind. Or you hear it in a sermon or on the radio or, or in a devotional. It is amazing how God speaks to us through his word. When I have my prayer time, my Bible is right with me. All the time. I know it's, it's weird for some of us in, in a certain generation to say, my Bible. But this is my Bible. The Word of God is in here. The Word of God doesn't change no matter what medium you read it on. Well, I love today's story. You guys familiar with it? It's one of my favorites in Scripture. But you might say, Pastor, what does today's story have to do with prayer? I mean, it's talking about Moses holding a stick in the air, right? I mean, that's what it says. But when you think about it, whose stick was it? Moses didn't say, I'm going to go up there and hold my stick in the air. He said, when I go to the top of the hill, I'm going to hold God's staff. Because God gave that to him. That staff that Moses carried represented the power and connection to God in his life. God presented that. It was just an old stick. We understand that. But it was God's power. And also, we understand that most of us today, the idea of bowing our heads in prayer is pretty foreign to this generation. Do you know how they prayed? Hands in the air. Isn't it amazing? We've become one-hand surrenderers. I know I've said this before, right? The guy goes, stick him up, you go. That is part of what prayer is, is surrender. 
Raising hands in prayer and supplication, Moses was holding the staff of God. And when he raised it in the air, he was pleading and conversing with God. That was the intention of it. So it definitely had to do with prayer. So let's get into the point today, into the points. Prayer is, can you read that okay? Yeah. An unnatural activity. One author has written this. From birth we have seen, or from birth we have been learning the rules of self-reliance as we strain and struggle to achieve self-sufficiency. Prayer flies in the face of those deep-seated values. It is an assault on human autonomy, an indictment of independent living. To people in the fast lane determined to make it on their own, prayer is an embarrassing interruption. I would say that's probably true for most people. And if we really think about it, it is often true for a lot of Christians. Prayer is the idea of praying and relying on somebody else is not what we're taught from when we're little. We're taught to be self-reliant. We're taught to stand on our own two feet. We're taught, you know, that we, we, we make it by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? That, that's what we're taught. But prayer, the idea that we would rely on someone else to help us with our stuff, just doesn't really work for independent men and women. That's why I think Satan fights us the most here. He fights us probably more in prayer than in any other arena in our lives. An example, you set aside some time. This is my time for devotion. I'm going to spend time praying. What happens? The phone goes off. Someone knocks on the door. The kids who are supposed to be asleep aren't asleep anymore. There's an interruption. Something happens. And listen, often it's very legitimate things. It's not, it's not things that are, are necessarily easily identifiable as satanic. But Satan does everything he can to prevent us from spending time with God. Just like a relationship will fall apart if you don't spend time together. I, I mean... It, it can't, I mean, if you don't spend time getting to know each other, spending time talking and sharing and dreaming, then the relationship dissolves. Satan hates it when we spend time. I have a word called busy. And there's an acronym, that's it, it's, it was broken down. Busy, being under Satan's yoke. B-U-S-Y. Satan doesn't have to convince us that there isn't a God. Satan doesn't have to tempt us with sin. Satan doesn't have to beat us down. All Satan has to do for a lot of Christians is make us busy. Too busy. Kind of too busy not to pray. You get the idea? Busy is Satan's biggest attack. Prayer is an unnatural activity for most people. We have to go past it and let it become a supernatural activity in our lives. We need to learn to pray. Number two, why are we drawn to prayer? Why we are drawn to prayer? Why we are drawn to prayer? The first is this, letter A if you're following, it is our most intimate connection to God. The most intimate connection that we have to God comes through prayer. The goal of prayer is to get into God's presence. When we get to that place where we're truly connecting with God, we find peace and intimacy and joy and hope. That's like last night, I just needed a couple of minutes. I'd been running just crazy. And I need just a couple of minutes to stop, slow down, and just spend a few quiet moments with the Lord to help me center myself. You see, there's praying, and then there's praying. That's why the whole idea of written prayers and, and, and quoting written prayers and all those kinds of things it really doesn't work most of the time. You see, we can read the words But anyone can read the words. There's a difference between really praying. I mean, you can say to your wife, I, hunt, I love you, honey. 
in an offhand kind of flippant way. And, and, you, and you mean it. But then you can stop and say, I love you, honey. And it's a little different, isn't it? I would submit to you this. More rewarding than any answer to prayer that God can ever give you when you pray is coming into his presence. I'll never forget when I was a kid growing up in my home church, Gallup, New Mexico, um, little, it, the church, I don't know, maybe these two sections is the whole church, these two lower sections. And I still remember one time, and it was, it was one of the young men was asked to pray just for the offering, just for the offering. And he went up there and he said this. He said, Dear Lord, and Holy Spirit fell on the place. An offering prayer, folks. Do you you understand what I'm talking about? It's not about the words we say. It's about getting into the presence. and And the greatest benefit we get out of prayer is we get God. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said that. I was one of those guys. And he said, the, the in purpose of prayer, the intention of prayer is not to get something from God, it's to get God. That's our goal, is to get connected with him. And I pray that every one of you gets to the place where you're, you're walking and living and breathing in the presence, and so all you have to say is, dear Lord, and he's right there. And he just falls, and he just comes. And I tell you this, God can speak more to you in one second. In one second than you could speak to him in a hundred years. Because he knows you so much and he loves you. Letter B. God's power flows primarily through those people who pray. I wouldn't say all the time, but I would say 99.9% of the time, God's power flows through those people who pray. You've heard this statement before, when we work, we work. When we pray, God works. That's why Martin Luther had this idea. I have so much to do, I can't possibly accomplish it, so I pray. And then I allow God to partner with me, and he gets to do some of the work. You know, it's amazing how many coincidences happen when we pray. You ever notice that? God incidences, we call them. But people would call them coincidences. But when we take the time to pray, it's amazing how often those coincidences occur. Well, let's look at today's text for just a few minutes. Moses caught on pretty fast. Can you get the scene here? Joshua... The Amalekites are coming. I want you to assemble your force, and you're going to go out and do battle. He said, while you're doing battle down here, I'm going to go up on the hill here, and I'm going to do battle in prayer. It didn't take very long for Moses to to figure out that when the staff was up, they were winning. And when the staff came down, they were losing. He was a pretty smart guy. I mean, leading the whole group. He figured that out. You know, I think most of you could probably figure that out. Right, Gales? Up, win, down, lose. Right? There's multiple applications here, but folks, I guarantee you, if you don't pray, your odds of winning are really low. And I guarantee you when you're in the middle of the situations, especially when you're in the middle of battles. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Do you ever face any battles in life? Yeah, we could have a long testimony service about those battles. And I guarantee you, if you engage in battles with human um, strength, you're going to lose. Have, try, I, I, I challenge you, if you don't, I know many of you are smarter than I am, so you already do this, but I challenge you, when you go into those battles, to take the Lord's staff with you, his presence with you, and prayer. 
And I imagine you'll find that when you're connected with him, when you're engaged with him, when you're communicating with him, when you're praising, worshiping, all those things that go on in, in, in prayer, you win the battle. But I can guarantee you, if you don't, you won't. Well, we also notice from our story that uh, after a while, Moses' arms got tired. Apparently, it was a pretty long battle. It may have been a heavy stick. I don't know. But after a while, arms got tired. Anyone here ever get tired? No? Two of you? Yeah, all of us? Here's that exciting part of it. When Moses got tired, a couple of guys, Aaron and Hur, came alongside him. Whoops. And they held his arms up. What an incredible lesson about praying together. People go, well, I can pray at home. I don't need to come and pray with you guys. I beg to differ. I mean, hear me, I covet your prayers no matter when you give them and no matter what form you can give those prayers. But there is nothing more powerful than praying with someone. And I'll say this because I love you. You know how you can make me a better pastor? Come hold my arms up. Come pray with me. Come support me in that way. Spend time with me in treating God. Now, you can pray for me all the time you want at home. I, I appreciate that too. But praying together releases God's power in our midst in ways that we've probably never seen before. Is there anyone whose arms you can lift up in prayer? Third is this, how God feels about prayer. How, how often do we hear things like this? Well, you know, God is the creator of the universe. He's so busy keeping everything running, he doesn't have time for me. Right? Well, you know, if I ask God, if I just bring all my stuff to God, all the time asking him to help me, he'll just think I'm selfish. Or, you know, I know that God is rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but, but that's just metaphorical. So I really shouldn't ask God to help supply my needs. Jesus told a story about prayer. And I think we often get it a little backwards. Do you know the story? You've heard it before. It's a story out of Luke 18. It's the time I introduced a new word. It's the story of the importunate widow, often called the persistent widow. But I like the word importunate because it means stubbornly, unreasonably, stubbornly persistent. You know anyone like that? Don't say their name. Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with her plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see she gets justice so she won't come and eventually wear me out. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? How often do we misinterpret this parable? How often do we say, well, you know what? I, I get it. God's the judge. And he's busy. He's got a lot on his plate. And I am the widow. And I have problems. And I'm in trouble. And I need help. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and start bugging God. And if I bug God enough, and if I keep following him around, and I keep knocking on his door, I, I keep protesting, if I ask God enough, finally God will break down and he'll answer my prayers. Does that sound right? That is, how many, that is the way many people interpret this passage of Scripture. And I guarantee you, that is not what God intends. God doesn't... Listen, God is not like an earthly judge. 
who doesn't care about people. And we are not like the widow, although sometimes we are physically widows and sometimes we feel bankrupt. But we're not in that position to, a, to an earthly judge. God loves us. God cares about us. God, listen to me, loves to bless his kids. God loves to bless you. God wants to bless you. God wants to pour things into your life in superabundance. You've heard the story before of the guy who went to heaven and Jesus was showing him around and he went to the warehouse district. You didn't know there was a warehouse district in heaven, right? And he began showing these, this, this huge warehouse and up and down were aisles and he noticed pretty soon there were people's names on the shelves. And on each shelf there were stacks of boxes. And so he, he got a little curious and so he knew his name and he started, let's go this way and he found his name. And he goes, what are these? He goes, well, these, you know, are the blessings that I want to give to people. He said, well, how come so many of mine are still on the shelf? He goes, you never asked. God wants to bless us. God has incredible things. What, are so, what if some of the things that you so desperately need are left on the shelf because you never bothered to ask God for them? God is not like an earthly judge. He loves to bless you. This is what he said to his kids in Deuteronomy. Listen, this is very important. It's at the very beginning of it. If you follow my decrees and be careful to obey my commands. See, see we, this is where we get into trouble a lot. We say, God, give me, give me, give me, give me. God, I need, I need, I need. God, I want. God, da, 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 da. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands... I will send rain in its season. The ground will yield its crops, the trees of the field their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and grape harvest will continue until planting. You will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in the land. You will lie down. No one will make you afraid. I will remove savage beasts from the land. The sword will not pass through your country. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops of your land, the young of your livestock, the calves of your herd, and on and on and on. God promises that he will bless them if they do what? Obey him. If they seek the Lord and they follow him, the Lord will bless you in the land he's given you. He will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, and send rain on your land in season and bless all the work of your hand. You will lend to many nations but borrow from none. God wants to bless us. The value of persistent prayer is not that God will hear us, but finally that we will hear him. Did you know that God hears you the moment you whisper? The moment you cry out? But hear me, I know I'm guilty of this sometimes. Sometimes God will not speak, God cannot speak, until I shut up enough, long enough to hear him. God doesn't usually speak in the noise and the rush. He usually speaks in the quiet when we open our ears to hear him. One more today. Our Father's delight. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For what everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven... Give good gifts to those who ask him. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. It's the last part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was speaking. If imperfect fathers know how to give good gifts, I, I, I mean, imagine if an earthly father said this. Dad, I want some bread. He gives him a stone. Here, son, have a stone. How ridiculous does that sound? It's intended to be hyperbole, right? If his son asked him for a fish, Dad, I'm hungry. Can we have fish for dinner? Here's a snake. Tastes just like chicken. No. 
Sorry. That's Maybe to put it in more modern context, the son says, Dad, could you help me? I'm too busy. I don't have time to help you. Go help yourself. Right? He says, if earthly fathers behave this, don't behave this way to their children, how much more likely is God to behave and to love you? See, here's the deal. God's delight is you. God's delight is you. Now take a father's feelings for his children and multiply it exponentially and you'll know how your heavenly father feels about you. No one's voice is, sounds sweeter to God. And nothing in the cosmos would keep him from directing his full attention to your request. Do you believe that? God forgive us for often we don't act that way. We don't treat God that way. But this I, can't, I can guarantee you. There is no voice that is sweeter to the Father than your voice. Parents, you understand that. When the first time they say daddy or mommy, or when they learn to say I love you, <laughs> you can, I don't care if you're after something, whatever you want, you could have it. Or grandparents, you know the same thing. But you see, th those are just poor imitations to how God feels about us. Those are poor imitations to the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. I challenge you today, I, I encourage you with everything that's in me to understand how much God delights in you and how much he wants to spend time with you. And I know we come for prayer on Saturday nights or, or when you do your devotions and we have those prayer times and I, I know sometimes we're tired and we're worn and we go, oh, I just got to do it. But what if those times became the pinnacle rather than the add-on? Do you imagine that Martin Luther accomplished what he did without God's help? Every great man and woman in history have been prayer warriors. They are people who spent time, they follow Jesus' example. The scripture says he spent much time in prayer. Listen to me, folks. It's ridiculous that we don't get this, but if the Son of God himself spent much time in prayer, what should we do? We should spend much more time in prayer. And I'm not just talking about the quiet times away. Those are wonderful, and, and those should be glorious times that we spend in God's presence. But learning to constantly communicate, to practice the presence like we talked about last week, of connection with the God who loves us. Tory said this, we are too busy to pray and so we're too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but we accomplish little. Many services, but few conversations. Much machinery, but few results. Because we're too busy to pray. What if everything in our lives, in our church, our work, our families, is dependent upon our prayer connection with God? Can I tell you a secret? There's no what if. It is. It is. There is no gift that we can give to our kids greater than praying for them and with them. There's no gift that we can give to each other that's greater than praying for and with people. God loves us. And he loves to spend time with us. One last slide. You'll get it. Father, thank you for today. 
Thank you for the privilege of coming to your house and worshiping together with this wonderful family. Lord, I pray that that we would understand how much you love us, how, how much you delight in us, and how much you want to spend time with us. Lord, I, I pray that we, would, uh, that we would commit ourselves, that I pray that we would be drawn to and, and commit ourselves because we have no other choice, no other option to truly become men and women of prayer. It's important. It's hard work sometimes, we understand that, but there is no greater thing that we can do as your children than to spend time in your presence, praying, agreeing together, and fighting that battle. Lord, as we leave this place in a few moments, I pray that, that your presence would go with us, that you would surround us, and, and that we would be inspired, perhaps anew, for some of us to really spend time in prayer, to make it a habit in, in ways that we never have before. And Father, I pray that you would radically transform us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, so that when people see us, they see him. When they hear us, they hear him. And through that, people would be drawn to you and you would be glorified. Father, thank you. Thank you for meeting with us. We just want to tell you how much we love you, how privileged we are to be your kids. Just pray for your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please stand and greet those around you in whatever is an appropriate way.